Good afternoon to our friends in Europe and good morning to everyone joining uh, from the United States. I'm Alina Polyakova. I am the president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis coming to you from Washington, DC. SIPA is a US-based think tank devoted to promoting close and enduring ties between the, the United States and Europe. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you tuning in via Zoom or following along on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube to this discussion on central European priorities in a post-COVID environment co-hosted by our friends at the Globsec Policy Institute coming to us from Bratislava. So a special thank you to Alena Kutsko, who will be leading today's discussion. But before I pass it over to Alena, I want to note that many Central Eastern European countries have fared better against COVID than their Western counterparts. And now that the initial shock of the virus is beginning to abate and countries are starting to reopen their economies, leaders are turning their attention to the long-term implications of COVID for economies and national security. How countries keep their economies afloat in the wake of COVID-19 is going to be a generational challenge. Today's discussion will focus on how Central Eastern European countries' priorities have shifted in response to the COVID crisis, especially now that they have begun the process of reopening. This conversation is part of SIPA's broader body of work on Central and Eastern Europe, in particular, looking at the common challenges we face. And now that common challenge is, of course, the COVID-19 crisis. We have been lucky at SIPA to have the opportunity to host uh, previous conversations with the Foreign Minister of the Czech Republic, Minister Tomasz Petracek, and also the Foreign Minister of Poland, uh, Jacek Czaputowicz. Uh, regarding both countries' response to the pandemic. For those of you tuning in on Zoom, there will be time for questions that you can pose later in the discussion. And for those of you tuning in on Twitter, Facebook, and elsewhere, please use the hashtag common crisis and tweet questions to at SIPA or at Globsec. And now before further ado, let me open formally and welcome our distinguished speakers, Alesh Ahmelar, who is the Deputy Minister for European Issues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the Czech Republic, Martin Klus, the State Secretary for European Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign and European Affairs of Slovakia, and Konrad uh, Zimanski, who is the Minister of European Affairs of Poland. I'm sure this will be a lively and informative conversation. Thank you all for taking the time to join us. And with that, let me turn it over to my wonderful co-host, Alena Kuchko, Director of the Globsec Policy Institute, who'll be moderating today's conversation. Alena, over to you. Thank you very much, Alena, for the introduction. Good afternoon and good morning to all our participants joining from various time zones and greetings from Bratislava. Ministers, uh, Globsec is very delighted to have you with us, many of you again. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be with us today. This event is part of our Globsec effort to help find and facilitate the best ways for Europe to overcome the current health, economic, and political crisis. We are very pleased to have this event in partnership with our great colleagues from the Center for European Policy Analysis. We will aim to make this discussion conversational, so I will jump straight into the first question. There have been contrasting assessments of the European responses to the COVID-19 crisis, including the joint European response, both in terms of health measures, but also in terms of tackling economic, political, and social challenges associated with it. What do you think? Is the European Union and individual member states, are they on the right track in overcoming the multiple crises we're all facing? And maybe you can also lead us a little bit about the highlights of how your national policies and priorities at the European level have changed as an outcome of the crisis. Uh, Minister Kneller, I would start with you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And also thank you for uh, inviting me to this very interesting and timely debate. And uh, congratulations to Globsec also to gathering with you so many good speakers actually in uh, this week and, and in general on this very important topic. 
Uh, on your questions, uh, rather briefly, because it would uh, require quite a large analysis and many data uh, is not available yet. But what, what has to be said above all is that everybody was taken by surprise that Central and Eastern Europe might have been a little bit more prepared because we've seen the consequences not just in China, but already in Italy and in our case also in Austria. So we had time to prepare and also to judge our steps that we do. But in terms of the impact on the EU, it was to some extent asymmetrical and it creates maybe some questions on the very handling of uh, the crisis by the EU. What has to be underlined nevertheless is that the EU did not have any tangible uh, competence uh, in terms of uh, crisis management uh, and it had coordination role of course but since the crisis was so unprecedented and since every single member state did come back to, to itself a little bit and looking inside itself into its normal crisis management mechanisms uh, we were not able to reap uh, the fruits of the common EU policy the first weeks. Uh, what will be crucial nevertheless is how we take the next uh, weeks and months in terms of also the negotiation of the recovery instruments and of the common economic response. Because up to now, even though the economic impact has been huge and uh, we can expect further, uh, further impact, uh, then the, the impact has not yet become structural. Now, if restaurants open, if businesses start to run, and if industry is renewed, we could expect it in terms of months even the global economy and uh, for sure the European economy could come back actually to its sort of equilibrium of the before crisis. So the changes might not be structural for the time being, but we are really moving very fast into a moment where some of the changes will not be uh, reversible. Uh, we will see some structural changes certainly in value chains, which will have a big impact also on the position of Central and Eastern Europe because we are uh, a manufacturing uh, power and uh, superpowers inside the EU, as V4 countries, we represent also a bigger import partner uh, for Germany than many, uh, many larger economies, be it, of course, China, but also some other EU member states and, and, and big EU member states. And uh, we will see how exactly we will have the structural impact. What uh, my last point on, on the overall impact and what we have seen until now is that the crisis, the COVID crisis, has come in a moment where we've seen uh, many other crises on the table, not just on the EU table. There were global issues, there were trade uh, questions, multilateral order was put into question on several occasions. Uh, it concerned also the crisis, for example, in, in terms of the WHO reaction and, and others. But also inside the EU, we had a lot of unresolved or semi-resolved issues, be it not just the Eurozone one, which we might come to terms maybe even as part of this uh, response to the COVID crisis. But there was, of course, the migration issue that was still not closed since 2015. There were also issues on the deepening of the single market and the finalization of the digital market. Uh, we did not have a complete plan for the Green Deal and for the transition to the uh, carbon-free economy. So there were so many questions opened. And I hope that because the crisis came, uh, which came with COVID, was so complex, uh, and so critical, it could be maybe a wake-up call for many of us actually that we need to handle the crisis together and maybe for the future to also to create competences for the EU to be able to better handle actually such a crisis in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, for highlighting also the um, urgency of the crisis, but also its nature as a wake-up call. And uh, passing the floor to Minister Szymanski, I would also ask uh, Mr. Minister, in your introduction, if you can also reflect to the reflection by Minister Hneller that potentially this crisis will require some redefinition of the competences of the European Union and potentially increasing the scope and scale of the competences of the EU. I think uh, when we are talking about uh, COVID experience in the widest possible sense, uh, we should uh, talk about at least two different Mr. Minister, I think we lost you. Epidemiological crisis in Europe, so we uh, were all It's a bit price and to act in the
Mr. Minister, I think we're losing you a little bit. If you could try to look at the connection. Apologies everybody for the technical difficulties here. And while we're waiting for the minister to come back, I will then come go back to uh, Minister Hmelers and ask a little bit for a follow-up to your... Uh, is it fine? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't know what, what happened. That, so, so there are two different aspects, purely epidemiological, when the reaction of the, of the, of the states is, is a question of political uh, um, decisions, the decision making and the political stability here and political trust is a is very important asset. The other thing is, is much more complex. Uh, it, uh, I, I would say that all economic consequences, including the, the consequences for the um, competence uh, order in the EU, is much wider uh, and here as you may remember our reaction i mean reaction to warsaw together with rome together with paris um, uh, was quite uh, skeptical uh, we um, believed since the very beginning that the um, european union probably has no specific role to play in uh, issues like public order and, and rightly so, because uh, public order, purely health issues, um, this sort of decisions uh, should be made uh, as close to the people as possible. So there, I don't see any added value of, for example, locking down society or locking down economies at the European level. We should be realistic. I think it is not only the question of the, of the relevant decision on, on right time, right decision, but also the question of the legitimization, uh, which is better, of course, at the regional national level where, where the state is and will be uh, a crucial actor. But on economic aspects, uh, um, European role uh, is and should be uh, stronger. Uh, and here we are, uh, this is quite the right time to talk about it because we believe that the first reaction, the financial reaction of the union was too limited. Uh, it's another story why I, I believe that the most important problem of the EU is uh, financial limitations imposed by the frugals. Uh, sometimes uh, member states which would like to, to present themselves as the most pro-European and at the same time they limit the, the abilities, the opportunities of, of the European Union to, to act because the financial aspect of the Union is, is a prerequisite for the efficiency of our uh, of our action at the European level. But here uh, today, we are in quite different situation because uh, in March, uh, it was, I think, legitimate to say that Europe should be much more active in terms of transfers, support, uh, all instruments of recovery and resilience. Now, uh, with the European Commission's proposal, uh, not only MFF, but also European uh, instrument of recovery and resilience, uh, recovery fund, to put it generally, uh, we are in a different situation. I think the scale of the fund proposed, as proposed by the European Commission, is relevant. This time it is relevant. Of course, it is not uh, too much, having in mind that according to the European Commission's uh, own assessment, the investment gap in the EU will be uh, one and a half trillion euro during the next two years. So the offer to have a 750 billion isn't, isn't too much, definitely, but it's, uh, it's, it's relevant. I hope it will be relevant also in, in terms of uh, time, because in this case, time is really money. The longer we are waiting with the injection of money to our economies, uh, the, the higher the cost will be for our own economies and for our citizens, for our businesses. So we, of course, invite uh, our colleagues to conclude this discussion as quick as possible and put this money uh, to, to European um, economies. Of course, uh, according to our estimation, the accumulated um, flow of money offered as a state aid or as a European support uh, is still below the level of the US, which is important to, to remember that it is not, nothing excessive in, in this. But I think the, the European Commission's response on, um, for economic uh, drama uh, post-COVID uh, consequences or for our economies now uh, is, is relevant uh, and it is uh, very important 
experience because we should uh, remember that this is the way how union can uh, make our life uh, better. And this is the way how Europe, European Union can prove that it is a very, um, a very important aspect in our uh, situation. Of course, this is not only about financial transfers. I think uh, equally important. Uh, I just wanted to mention two things. First of all, single market, which uh, is still not finished, especially in services. This is untapped potential, very important in, in time of crisis. And the second aspect, state aid policies and competition policy, uh, non-financial uh, regulatory aspect of the union with a huge potential, uh, exclusive community-based uh, competences, where uh, if uh, used properly, uh, they can add uh, enormous support for recovery and anti-crisis policies in our countries. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Minister, also for putting the uh, scale of financial aid into perspective. The IMF has released another report and the contraction is Europe uh, does not seem to uh, look very well, regardless of the amounts of fun funds that are promised to be injected. Uh, Minister Klus, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We've been discussing here the origin, the first reflections on the initial re reactions of the European Union and the nation states to the uh, coronavirus crisis and the sufficiencies of the reactions. What is your take? Is the European Union doing enough today? Good afternoon to everybody. Hope you can hear me and. Uh... Everything goes well, also with the video. Uh, sorry for being a bit late, uh, and uh, thank you for uh, invitation to this interesting discussion. Uh, I guess uh, we are facing uh, a huge trouble uh, in all of our countries, as long as, uh, for instance, for Slovakia, we have a prediction of minus 10% uh, of GDP, uh, not growth, but this line uh, for this year. And that's why, uh, the only chance uh, for us how to uh, recover our economies are uh, uh, to be as strong as uh, possible, uh, strong as possible uh, together in the European Union because uh, because uh, common response is the only chance how to manage it, and that's why I really really appreciate uh, to have. Uh, opportunity uh, to discuss uh, this new generation EU uh, way of funding and recovering our economies. And uh, so far it seems uh, to us that uh, it uh, should be a very important uh, instrument uh, uh, for recovering of uh, Slovak economy. Uh, we are aware that uh, it will be billions of euro uh, we need to spend in uh, just a couple of years. And uh, we understand that it's a very uh, special system of financing, uh, which could be ideologically, ideologically complicated for uh, some of us. But uh, on the other hand, uh, as long as we are facing a uh, symmetric shock, uh, it's important for us uh, to have such an opportunity. And uh, uh, we are heavily dependent on each other. And we understand with that uh, we need a common European response uh, for both uh, 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 Southern and, and also the other countries uh, of the European Union, because uh, in this case, uh, if uh, something will happen in, in Italy or Spain or Greece or some other countries, uh, we will feel it immediately in uh, Central Eastern Europe as well. And uh, that's why uh, I really appreciate that uh, on the last uh, GAC meeting, all of us uh, spoke about a uh, kind of solidarity. Uh, there was uh, quite a lot of uh, question marks uh, why European Union was not uh, efficient enough uh, uh, at the very end of the process uh, of a pandemia. Uh, but uh, I guess uh, this uh, MFF and uh, new generation is uh, one of the best answers we can uh, get. Uh, and also one of the best answers uh, for people who are uh, somewhat hesitating uh, in our uh, support to, to the European Union integration. So. That's why uh, I'm very positive and I'm really looking forward for uh, the first uh, real discussion which will take place in Brussels, uh, 17th and 18th of uh, July. Uh, that will be the first uh, summit of my prime minister. And uh, we are ready uh, to be a very constructive partner and try to find uh, compromise as soon as it gets. 
as long as I heard from uh, Konrad, uh, this is this is very important for us, and uh, uh, we need a response immediately, uh, also because of the market, uh, but also uh, to show uh, unity of 27 countries and uh, uh, help uh, each other as much as we get. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister, and. Uh... I would want to follow up with a very quick question to all three of you, and that concerns the negotiations that are going to be held in Brussels, and uh, if you are willing to share with us a little bit of negotiation strategy planning. There has been recently a meeting of the V4 uh, Prime Ministers, but also yesterday Minister Hmeller uh, hosted a call with the V4 in Germany and Austria. Uh, could you please lead us whether there is a joint V4 position towards the negotiation, whether V4 is going to act as a block, and if there is a position, I uh, would be very delighted to hear what are the issues that we are jointly going to be arguing in favor. Uh, Minister Hellers, would you like to start? Thank, thank you very much. I think that during the meeting of V4 Prime Ministers on the 11th of June, we've reached uh, a common ground inside the V4, and uh, we were quite clear on the in warning uh, in, in, on two main issues. I mean, the first one is the absorption capacity for such a big instrument, and the second one is also uh, the allocation criteria, which might still need some fine tuning in order to be really uh, a good response to, to the very crisis. But what I wanted to underline is the process that we have in front of us. I wanted to underline the fact that uh, mutualization of common liabilities has been an issue inside the European Union, an intellectual one maybe for decades, uh, a real policy one uh, for the last 10 years, and uh, I would say one that was almost unresolvable. And despite the fact that we made even sweet adjustment uh, inside the TSCG, inside the six-pack and other instruments, we were in a way not able uh, to go into uh, mutualization of liabilities in the past uh, 10 years. And now we have basically months and weeks to decide on this and to explain it to our citizens. So the process that is in front of us is not just about the negotiation. It is about the socialization. It is about explaining to the citizens what actually is happening and that we are actually introducing inside the EU an instrument that is uh, based on a certain insurance or reinsurance uh, mechanism and where there is uh, a significant uh, mutualization of, of liabilities and creates maybe a stronger bond for the future uh, and even though temporary one, it transforms the EU into something, uh, something more. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, Minister Szymanski. You're muted. by myself. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that we are talking about exceptional uh, measures uh, for exceptional situation for, for, for only for this reason and only for limited uh, time uh, with the limited duration of the program, limited repayment scenario, very strict scenario. So I wouldn't like to uh, define this program as a mutualization of debt or, or liabilities even, because the only thing we are doing now is uh, just a higher level of EU transfers. The transfers we know very well since the very beginning. And this, this is why we wanted to put it in the context of MFF, of the, of the multi-annual budget of the EU, because I agree that, uh, that we are stepping on thin ice uh, from the point of view of uh, especially some member states where the debt crisis was uh, um, a traumatic experience, uh, and rightly so, because it was something uh, equally unprecedented and equally fearful for, for many. Now we are talking about something much more uh, under control, let's say. So we are happy to see that the European Commission uh, decided to create a mechanism like this. Of course, there are many things to be discussed, as, as Alice already mentioned. I don't want to go into details, but I think in time of crisis, um, in such a scale, we need uh, a relevant uh, answer, also in terms of money, uh, in terms of scale. It is not only regulatory aspect, uh, the single market and state aid policy is not enough. We need also injection of money. And we have a problem in the union because uh, state aid, I mean, national state aid uh, is different in terms of scale in different member states because of obvious things that the capacities of member states are different. So I think the, the, the European recovery instrument would help to 
touch the ground or, or, or establish a kind of level playing field among our economies to compensate for those who are not in a position to, 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 to inject uh, such an amount of, of money. So this is the right aspect of the, uh, of the European Commission's approach. Of course, MFF, the traditional multi-annual uh, financial framework is still an unresolved problem because we believe that we have to continue our discussion about the future of treaty-based policies, namely cohesion, which is a structural or regional policy uh, and, uh, and agriculture. We believe uh, that uh, they are not outdated because they proved to be open for reforms. And already now, in our countries, for example, cohesion policy plays a growing role in digitalization, climate, biodiversity, and so on. So those policies are open to reform and are ready to be a right instrument for quite present future-oriented um, challenges we all have. But in the same time, we stress the importance of internal convergence at the single market level. This is beneficiary uh, for all of us. I think that one of the most toxic aspects of this discussion is a reduction of the negotiation on budget, a reduction of the, of the EU integration to net position in the, in the budget. I think it is a budgetary populism to say something like this because the concept of single market and trade, deep trade integration means that in the end, we are all highly beneficiary. To be honest, countries which would like to, to, to present their negative net position in, in the budget, um, they are most successful uh, in, in internal trade at the EU level. So I think we should remind themselves and remind all of us, I mean Europeans, that European budget with a very small scale, 1% of the GDP, is very important for all of us and there are no losers in this debate. The net position uh, in this uh, Excel um, tables isn't enough to understand the beauty of the integration and the economic sense of integration. And I think during the uh, next couple of weeks, we have to remind it, uh, our colleagues uh, even stronger to present the budget in the end to our societies, especially the most frugal societies, uh, in a way which would be not only acceptable, but, but uh, attractive to them. Because without a trade integration in the, in the common market, they wouldn't be so rich. They got enormous transfers of money from Central Europe because we are developing nicely. We are, we are doing best. Uh, we, we contribute to the success of European economies. According to some statistics, without uh, economic growth in V4 countries, the um, average economic growth of the EU would be negative. So we contribute a lot and we should recognize this very fact. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, Minister Klus, I'll let you wrap up this discussion on the joint V4 position, but also we'll ask a follow-up question from the discussion we had with you, uh, but also the Czech and Austrian counterparts a couple of weeks ago, where um, the three of you shared the perception that uh, in the negotiations about the next budget, there is no acting as a block and everybody acts in the interest of their country, hence there is not going to be a joint block position. Do you still share this perception or something has changed uh, during the negotiations in the past couple of weeks? Well, uh, don't you have an easier question? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we four uh, as a block, uh, actually I'm very happy uh, that we were able to manage uh, common LTTs uh, uh, during the Lednice meeting uh, uh, last uh, uh, two weeks ago. And uh, I believe uh, we were very much uh, uh, on the same uh, wave uh, if it comes to some uh, activities we want to uh, have together uh, at the summit. Uh, and um, I'm more or less sure that there are very interesting uh, and important uh, changes we need to propose together. Uh, for instance, uh, we need more trust, uh, we need more flexibility, and we need more time. Uh, this is what we repeat all together uh, to the European Commission. And uh, uh, this has uh, uh, something to do also with the question what the reform mean, because uh, 
European Commission is uh, proposing us uh, to uh, have a uh, uh, sufficient program uh, of reforms uh, uh, and to use all of these uh, billions uh, for uh, something that will help uh, uh, our economies uh, for a uh, mid-term or long-term uh, period. Uh, and I, I'm more or less sure that uh, uh, all of our countries are uh, ready to uh, have such a reforms. But uh, what we need to hear also from our uh, partner countries, especially from the south of the Europe, is the definition of the reform. And I guess uh, this is what we have in common in V4. Uh, also, we have in common in V4 that uh, two years is not enough, uh, as it is proposed by the Frugals 4. Uh, I can't imagine, to be very honest to you, that Slovakia will be able to manage a couple of billions of euro in two years only. Uh, so that's why uh, I believe we can act as a bloc uh, uh, to push on the Commission and also on the frugal uh, countries that we need more time. Uh, I believe it's four years, so maybe it will be three years, but definitely not at two years. So, so this is what we have in common. and. Uh, uh, I, I, I can imagine that we will uh, find a, a common uh, position uh, also if it comes to the new own resources, which is also part of the discussion, uh, because um, for all of our countries, uh, it's probably politically unacceptable that uh, there will be somebody else to tax our citizens than our national governments. Uh, so that's why let's speak about the new own resources, but there are some red lines for us in V4, and uh, I can imagine that uh, all of these topics we can uh, we can join as a block. And then, then of course, there are some uh, differences among us, which is natural. And uh, also, we understand, uh, especially Czech and Hungarian uh, position, uh, which is not uh, uh, the same as the one we have in, uh, in uh, this allocation key. And also, uh, Poland is a little more successful in this. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, kind of solidarity is inevitable. So I'm happy that uh, my prime minister a couple of times mentioned that we understand our V4 uh, neighbors that they are not uh, happy with the allocation key. And uh, we are ready to support them if it comes to some, uh, let's call them gifts or uh, changes. But of course, uh, our national position is quite clear that uh, all the changes uh, could be made only if uh, it will not be against uh, Slovak position, which is probably natural. So this is our position to the V4. Uh, Block uh, as the one which sh sh should uh, uh, discuss uh, the proposal of the commission together. Uh, but uh, very frankly said, uh, there are some uh, uh, other uh, like-minded countries uh, like uh, Portugal, like Slovenia, uh, some others. Uh, uh, we count on uh, if it comes to the discussion. And as I said in uh, my first uh, uh, block, uh, uh, we are ready to be very constructive partner and we are ready for compromises because uh, what we need, uh, desperately need now is uh, to have a quick decision and uh, start to use this money to recover our economies. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. and. Uh... I'm very eager to follow up on the, your suggestion to speak more about the new common resources. And you mentioned that there are significant uh, red lines in each of the countries. Uh, can I ask please all three of you in a very brief yes or no potentially type of answer, could you let us know whether, um, let's start with Slovakia, Slovakia will support or veto the uh, digital tax carbon tax and financial transaction tax is a potential new common resource for the EU. Very simply, we are ready to discuss all of these three uh, new own resources uh, for European Commission. Uh, it's, it's, ne it's inevitable to uh, have a very clear vision what all the, of these taxes uh, mean for all of us. Uh, because I can feel that there are some differences and expectations uh, among 27 uh, member states, but uh, we are ready for discussion for all of uh, these three you mentioned. Uh, Minister Chmielarz, uh, is Czech Republic open to the discussion on these three potential new common resources? Well, thank you for this very, uh, very good question. Very briefly, traditionally, the Czech Republic 
has been very skeptical about new own resources. And we have voiced uh, several times also uh, during the discussion on the MFF itself before the crisis, our skepticism towards the new uh, own resources. Nevertheless, uh, the situation today has changed. It is also a temporary character that should be assigned to some of the new resources. We are implementing on the national level our digital tax, uh, which means that in principle we would be also open for a, a common EU approach. On carbon tax, it really much the, lies the devil in the detail. If it's a cross-border carbon tax, then it's very, something very different, something that we could potentially accept. If it is uh, ETS-based, then not really at this point. Uh, then we have aspects of the FTT. I think it it is a debate, maybe a 10 year old. I'm not sure that it is on the table. And we're also quite skeptical in the past. Uh, but in general, what we have to understand on all common resources is that this is of an extraordinary, extraordinary nature and that there are some common, let's say, brand new common resources offered, such as the single market levy, which could be maybe positive for Central European countries where we do not have many, maybe larger companies. But still, this is very fresh and very new for us to, to be able to say yes or no uh, immediately. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, Minister Szymanski. We see clearly uh, enormous opposition uh, to uh, offer a national contributions to EU budget by some member states. It is not the case in Central Europe, but in some other member states. The opposition is very, very clear. It creates uh, uh, basic limitations for European project. So we propose to change the proportion between national contributions and genuine own resources. And we are absolutely not only open, but we actively promote the idea of own resources uh, for the European Union. Of course, details are important, but the basic uh, criteria we want to use is regressive or progressive nature of the own resources. This is why we oppose ETS-based own resources, because it would create situation when um, smaller economies and poorer economies would pay more than the richest country in the EU. It is unfair, unacceptable, and I think it is pretty clear for everyone that we will not accept it. But we, in the same time, we constructively propose to work hardly an uh, uh, ambitious um, uh, way um, on a single market levy, a carbon adjustment uh, border, external border um, mechanism, um, FTT, or digital tax. Yes, this is the right answer, of course, with proportions, with details, but this is the, the right way to, to address the problem of limited uh, um, financial resources of the EU. If EU, uh, is to stay relevant in our situations around us. We have to get more money and, and this is the way how to do it. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And I'll start bringing up the participants with questions live. And we have a question from uh, Kinga Brudinska. Kinga, please unmute yourself. Sorry, I'm here now. Thank you very much, ministers, for uh, your time and your um, uh, remarks. I have a question a little bit different from, from the discussion that we uh, just have had. Uh, yesterday, the Council agreed on its position to, on the Conference on Future of Europe. Therefore, I would like to ask, what are your um, plans in your, uh, in your countries when it comes to this conference? What are your ex uh, ex uh, expectations? And um, maybe some tips on and you can share with us uh, your experience uh, how uh, you plan to make it in a way that we don't um, just repeat this bureaucratic exercise that we had uh, with uh, engaging citizens in, in a bigger debate on, on future of Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and let's start from the other end, Minister Szymanski. Thank you. Uh, we advocate for openness of the conference uh, on the future of Europe in, in many senses. I think there is no risk that it will be bureaucratic, but there is a risk that it will be a conference for professional Europeanists. We are all to some degree professional Europeanists, but if the conference is going to, to offer any added value, uh, we have to open it for the society as it is. 
This is why we advocate for a stronger involvement of the national parliaments because they are definitely more representative than, than any other assembly. Uh, it is a, a democratic representation of every nation and I think it, it, it should be promoted. Of course, we already have uh, a quite lively uh, contribution and, and role of the European Parliament and we would like to make it open also in terms of conclusions. We don't want to have any taboo uh, among the conclusions. So what we hear right now that for some countries, uh, for example, treaty change is a taboo, it is uh, artificial. I don't believe that it is very easy to, to change the treaty, but we shouldn't, at the very beginning of the exercise, we shouldn't to create any, any sort of taboo. We should open the door for any sort of discussions. We shouldn't also predefine uh, any conclusions of the, of the conference. Probably we need more Europe in many aspects. The lesson of COVID could create some uh, very relevant uh, conclusions and recommendations, but maybe in some other aspects we need less Europe. So we should be also open in, in this sense. That's all. I don't hear. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Minister. Uh, Minister Klus, your take on the Conference of the Future of Europe, and we know that you're in charge in the government of uh, working on it. Yeah, I can easily say that we are ready. And uh, now we are discussing details how this uh, conference should look like uh, also at the national level. Uh, we had an experience with uh, uh, so-called national convention before, and uh, we believe that uh, uh, some of the uh, activities we had were very uh, fruitful, and uh, we would be very happy to, to involve also uh, partners from uh, uh, third sector and uh, academic environment, uh, and uh, we are ready uh, to uh, get out uh, from the bubble we are living in, Exactly as Konrad said, uh, we don't want to speak to European uh, professionals or professionalists. Uh, we want to speak to the regular citizens, uh, what kind of Europe they expect. And uh, that, that will not be an easy uh, job. And uh, we understand that uh, for some people, uh, it, it, it's quite a complicated topic uh, as long as uh, they have no idea how the European institutions works and uh, uh, what uh, they should bring to us. But uh, uh, the main idea of, uh, of uh, this uh, Future of Europe uh, conference uh, is that we are European Union. So uh, that's why we believe that uh, uh, all of our countries needs to bring something uh, on the table and discuss uh, what kind of uh, future of Europe uh, we expect. And uh, more or less sure that uh, this will be very uh, important topic of the German presidency, and we are ready to be a very uh, active part of that. Uh, this question is heavily interconnected with uh, if we are ready to open the uh, treaties of uh, uh, European Union, and uh, we are quite pragmatic in this case, and we know that uh, it is not that problematic to open the treaties, but it's problematic to find a compromise and to close them. And uh, we understand that, for instance, for some governments like the one in Austria, this is a very important topic. We are uh, ready to discuss it, but uh, to be very honest again uh, to you, I'm not that much sure if uh, uh, we are able to find a compromise and we are uh, ready to really open uh, the treaties because uh, there are some countries we are, which are uh, openly against uh, such a uh, uh, possibility and uh, we of course uh, respect that uh, it uh, could be very very complicated especially after the experience we had uh, from 2009 uh, if it comes to the Lisbon Treaty I guess our Czech friends uh, know what I'm talking about and uh, especially uh, European uh, constitution let's call it like this uh, uh, and uh, the experience we have from France and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so this is what we don't uh, want to experience again. Uh, and I hope uh, we are uh, all now in the process of the lessons learned uh, from this uh, historical experience. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. Minister Hnelas, 
Czech Republic has been uh, famous for a little uh, flavor of Euroscepticism in the country. Do you think that the Conference on the Future of Europe will um, in increase the uh, love towards the European Union in the country? And do you consider having cross-border consultations, for example, between Czechs and Slovaks or Czechs and Poles, maybe with the hope that the neighbors can infect the Czechs with a little bit more enthusiasm for the European Union? Well, thank you for this question. I think that uh, skepticism per se is actually a good quality because it requires you to look on what you are offered, for example, uh, with your due diligence and really to analyze it before you accept it. Uh, and I think that skepticism should not be taken as a, uh, as a negative in this debate overall, especially when we talk about the EU future and if we would be talking about the treaty change, because this is a very serious issue that can be actually counterproductive also in the long term. And uh, my colleagues have already pointed, pointed that out, that if we are facing um, you know, hurdles in terms of uh, the treaty change ratification, this could actually end up dividing Europe much more than what those advocating now for treaty change as part of the, of the process uh, would want. But uh, taking aside such serious issues such as treaty change, which could really and should come only uh, at the end of the debate if we see that uh, we do not have any other choice to improve the workings of the EU. I think what has to be very clearly said is also for this debate, as Konrad has said, not to become a debate for Europeanists, to try to concentrate on topics with added value to the citizens. And uh, despite that, we had and we've heard from uh, different uh, member states and from different uh, uh, areas, the ideas for institutional change. We've heard uh, you know, debates that are needed on Spitzenkandidat or on reform of the electoral law to the European Parliament. These are not questions which concern our citizens, I dare to say. And they are really uh, an internal discussion uh, on, uh, on what the EU should do, maybe in terms of how it could do, but it's a very much Brussels-based or Brusselist uh, discussion in this respect. And I don't, don't mean it negatively, but it's for specialists. What our citizens, I think, need to know is that we have to quali clarify the question on what the EU, what role should the EU play uh, in the world and what should be our common ambition. And Conrad very much has pointed out that maybe in some aspects uh, we do not need the EU to be present. It is not a Eurosceptical position, in my view. It is just a, a very pragmatical one based on, um, on, on the effect that we really need uh, the decisions to be taken as close to citizens to increase maybe also the credibility and legitimacy of the EU. And yet, yet we have to decide on areas such as the global role, what uh, the EU wants to, to do, whether we want to be a big player, whether, whether we want to really have the strategic autonomy and what is, for example, a strategic autonomy. We do not have a consensus yet. I don't think that we have a common understanding, for example, of the concept. And this is key, especially in the COVID crisis. It is uh, uh, key uh, when uh, the multilateral system actually is going through a certain transformation. We need to know what the EU is for and what ambition it should take. I think that's the most important aspect that we have to define. And maybe on the way we will solve some uh, more particular issues, uh, such as the double quality of foodstuff for Central Europe uh, or plastics, as, uh, as some other member states actually would also uh, want, for example. But these are the small added values um, that could also be part of the discussion, not just treaty changes and, and big questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. And uh, we'll follow up for the last round of questions with a few questions bundled together so that you can pick which ones you would like to react to. And uh, Milan Nietzsche is waiting in line to ask the question live. And while he's being brought in, I'll read out two more questions that go more into the uh, European global role in strategic autonomy issues. One of them connects the future of the European defense integration. And another one is asking uh, the ministers to reflect upon the uh, consequences of the potential digital tax on the relations with the United States. And Milan has a third question. Thank you, Aliana. Thank you very much to Globseg and to uh, SIPA for uh, organizing this webinar. Um, so now I'm, now I'm based at the German Council on Foreign Relations in Berlin, and therefore one question to all, and then one special for Minister Szymanski. Question to all of you is for other important topic of uh, mm -hmm. German EU Council presidency, which is relations with China. There will not be a summit at the 
at the leaders level in September, but what do you expect from the next half a year and from German uh, presidency um, to achieve in relations vis-a-vis -vis China? And now question to Minister Szymanski, mindful of our transatlantic audience in this webinar, I, I have to ask about uh, President Duda, your president's visit in, in the White House yesterday. The impression I got, I followed the, the press conference, was that there were no clear results, that this was a pre-election visit for President Duda, who is facing on Sunday elections in Poland, and he was played by President Trump for his elections. There was some tough messaging on, on, on moving NATO, on moving US uh, troops from Germany to Poland. How do you deal with your colleagues? I know this is not your portfolio, but relations in Europe is your portfolio. How do you address these concerns that your president was part of the pre-election game um, in the White House. Thank you very much. We, uh, we have a specific question to Minister Szymanski, so I would go with you first. Uh, and besides the question, we have the expectations uh, towards the German presidency and what's feasible to achieve vis-a-vis -vis China, European defense and digital taxation and implications on the EUS relations. Please, you do not have to answer all four of them, but feel free to pick up on the ones that you like the most. Minister Szymanski. I think all of those questions, including the specific question addressed by Milan to, to me, are related to, to, to the big question of the EU-US relations. And it is obvious that Poland is one of those countries which are concerned with the fact that the transatlantic ties, because of many reasons, it's, a, it's another seminar, but the transatlantic ties uh, are not granted uh, for the moment. And uh, you can easily imagine a situation when the transatlantic ties are weaker and weaker, which would uh, be at the expense uh, of our security. I mean, our own common security, not only Central European or Polish European security. We believe that we should invest and we should do our best uh, to um, uh, consolidate the unity of the West. Whatever political changes are happening in this capital or another capital, we have to find a, a common ground, maybe a new common ground for uh, closest possible uh, economic, political uh, and defense relations because the West is something wider than the EU. And, uh, and this is why we believe that uh, we should be careful with uh, uh, our reactions uh, to the political development in our own capitals, I mean European capitals, but also in capitals of the rest of the uh, of the NATO countries or, or the rest of the West. Uh, th this is why we, we are rather concerned uh, by the development in some other capitals than concerned by the development in Washington or Warsaw, uh, because we, we try to execute, we try to implement our agenda, which is well known for many, many years. We want to invest to the relations between EU, EU, EU Europe and, and US. And here we are with some very specific questions, not very easy to solve, but we have to concentrate on them, like the structural cooperation in defense on, on, Euro, on European side. We definitely support the strengthening of the defense cooperation in Europe. But we would like to be very clear that we don't want to create this uh, specific capacities. I hope um, much stronger capacities of Europe to take even bigger chunk of our responsibility for our own defense, not as an alternative to NATO, alternative to US, to transatlantic community, but as a contribution to, to this. This is, I think, a big issue because the great and very noble, nicely defined concept of um, strategic autonomy uh, in Europe uh, means many, many things. And I don't see any canonical definition of this uh, nice words, because I'm definitely uh, in favor of sovereignty or autonomy. Uh, I'm definitely in favor of uh, common recognition of strategic interest of Europe, but uh, I would be very careful with the proper understanding of this of this concept. We will defend the unity of the West, uh, wh whatever will happen, uh, whatever differences of, or divergences will occur. And of course, sometimes the divergences in our community occur. This is not the first time. For example, in trade, uh, we have some problems to be solved or recalibrate. It is, again, another issue, quite complex, but we have to be in goodwill 
we have to invest and we have to find a way how to calibrate best our common interest, common position, because in the world we are alone and uh, we have competitors and sometimes enemies somewhere else. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister. And we'll pass now to uh, Minister Khmelash. We're running out of time, so please do not feel pressured to answer all the questions. Okay, so I, I will stop actually on maybe on, on, on uh, German presidency and more specifically on China. What is clear is that the COVID situation itself has complicated, not just the Leipzig summit, of course, but also the, the traditional EU-China summit. And the negotiations could not take place really properly. And uh, despite the fact that we have still many problematic uh, topics on the table in terms of the EU relation to China, unresolved issues, uh, despite that fact, uh, the situation was not right. So uh, we will see actually how the German presidency will take it. What is still very clear is that we need this debate and we need a common position on China to avoid basically uh, the divide and rule um, strategy that could be detrimental to the strategic interest of, of the EU. So we need a common voice when we talk to China and I hope that the German presidency uh, will provide for this. And uh, just one last sentence on what Konrad said, I could sign uh, basically every single word. Uh, we need to be really realist in terms of the transatlantic uh, relationship. Uh, we do not have any alternative to the US engagement on uh, the European continent. And this is important to say, and I think that any alternatives are naive at this stage. So we have to be serious. And I'm glad that the Polish uh, president and Poland itself is actually creating this bind and trying to keep this transatlantic relationship alive, even in a political campaign or before or afterwards, whatever. This is still important for Europe and for Central Europe. Thank you very much, and Minister Klus. Thank you. Well, tough to uh, say anything else uh, than uh, uh, Alesh and uh, Konrad already mentioned, but uh, uh, if it comes to uh, US-EU relationship, uh, uh, of course, it's a very interesting combination now uh, with uh, COVID-19 situation and uh, pre-election time in US. Uh, but uh, I fully understand uh, what uh, Alej and Konrad uh, uh, spoke about when he uh, when they mentioned uh, that we need to fight for a unity of uh, West and that uh, there is no uh, other alternative or functional alternative uh, than this uh, unity. Uh, and uh, NATO is uh, the most important uh, uh, defending uh, alliance in the world, and that's why uh, we are all aware that we need uh, a very close cooperation with the United States and uh, there is uh, uh, no other chance uh, for us uh, now. Uh, if it comes to China, very briefly said that uh, we can't pretend nothing is happening there. Uh, for instance, in Hong Kong uh, lately, but uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to understand that uh, functional multilateralism is uh, very important for us. and. Uh, from this point of view, it's sometimes quite comic to follow that uh, it's a Chinese president who is uh, fighting hard for uh, free trade in the, uh, in the world. And uh, there is another uh, president who is uh, very unilateralistic. So uh, let's be frank in this case and uh, let's speak about how to bring back uh, functional multilateralism in our relationship with uh, both uh, China and United States. And we need to be more active in this case. And this is heavily interconnected also with the topic of uh, how the future uh, European Union look, have to look like. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, ministers, for the very insightful discussion and for your time with us. I'm going to pass the floor back to Alina to wrap up this discussion. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Alona. Thank you uh, to GlobeSec for hosting this incredibly insightful conversation together with SIPA. Um, Minister Shemansky, Secretary Hmelarsh, uh, Secretary Kluz, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, just to echo the, the discussion we're having at the end uh, regarding the, the importance of U.S. continued engagement with Central Eastern Europe, the importance of the transatlantic relationship, I couldn't agree uh, with you more. There is no substitute uh, for the transatlantic bind that we've built over many decades. Um, I'm delighted to see that the diplomatic relationship, especially with the recent visit of President Duda, continues, um, that I am confident that going forward, uh, there will be continued engagement with a Central Eastern European 
friends and colleagues and allied partners, as well as with the rest of Europe um, and, and NATO allies as well. Uh, we are all in this together, as all of you have said, and at the end of the day, we'll only come out of this stronger as a community if we're able to do more together, have the kinds of conversations that we had here today, exchange ideas, engage in a dialogue um, around our common shared values and, and purpose. Um, as all of you have mentioned, uh, the challenge of China is going to be a long-term generational challenge to all of us. Uh, the authoritarian model that uh, China is pushing forth, the kinds of economic and security incursions that we've seen Beijing take over the last years um, has been significant. And we all need to do our part to ensure that our citizens uh, are aware of the kinds of threat um, and challenges that China poses while at the same time uh, the reality of having to continue to work uh, with China, certainly uh, on the economic dimension, the political dimension. I'm sure there are many other questions that we didn't get to, that we didn't get to answer from those of you tuning in. Uh, but just a quick word from me before we sign off. Uh, once again, thank you to Globsec. Thank you to all of you. Um, and tomorrow, if those of you who are joining this discussion, at 10 a.m., we're also hosting a conversation at SIPA with Vice President uh, of the European Commission, uh, Vera Jourova, to talk about our common agenda for countering disinformation. So very much in line with the conversation we're having today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing the discussion in the future with all of you um, on, on this important issue as, as we navigate the COVID-19 crisis and its, and its fallouts. So with that, um, Alena, thanks again. Thank you, Globsec, and goodbye. Thank you, goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone.